right. Well, this morning, I've titled our message, A Confident Confession of Christ. And so, as we begin a new section here in chapter 10, we come to the great turning point in Hebrews, where the writer turns from the explanation of the superiority of the person and work of Christ to the application of it. In other words, he goes from doctrine to duty, from creed to conduct, from precept to practice, from instruction to exhortation. This transition here is meant to move his Christian readers in how they ought to live if they truly believe in the glorious realities of Jesus' priestly work. Today's passage, therefore, personally, for all of you, will show you that the priestly ministry of Jesus will produce in you a profound dual confidence. Confidence in your access to God and confidence in your advocate before God. And because of this, we can encourage one another to grow in assurance as we anticipate the glorious return of our Lord and Savior. So before we begin reading, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you have us here, that you brought us here. Um, you've ordained and planned this day, those that are here, um, for a reason and purpose. And so now that we ask that, we, that that purpose be fulfilled. I pray that everyone here will receive nuggets of truth, Lord truth that will change their lives, their hearts, their outlook in life. We want to hear from you. We want to know you more personally. So as we open up your word, may the words that we read Be deeply implanted into our hearts and our minds. We love you, Lord. We love you for all you've done, for giving us Jesus Christ, your Son, and for being so merciful to us. And we just honor you now with our eyes and our ears. Pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. The Word of God says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, He has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain that is through the flesh, through His flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. Is faithful. Now, by beginning with the word therefore in Verse 19, the writer not only marks a new section in this letter, but he also leads us into some implications that come as a result of God's pledge in verse 17. And there he pledges to never again remember their sins and their lawless acts. And so what the author is now doing is that he's moving from the truths that he had previously discussed to how believers ought to respond to those truths. 
So simply put, since God has promised to never recall a believer's sin, a believer's sins, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. Verse 20 further explains that by his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain of the most holy place. So you see, no old covenant worshiper could have been bold enough to enter the holy of holies in the tabernacle. Only the high priest could enter it, and even that, only once a year. And as I been covering in, uh, in previous messages, there was a thick curtain that separated the, the Holy of Holies and the Most Holy Place. That veil was essentially a barrier between people and God. Now, however, on account of Christ's work on the cross, believers can now enter into the very presence of God with boldness. By God's grace, the door is now wide open for us to come directly to Him. This letter has clearly shown us that as Christians, we have unfettered access to God because the blood of Jesus Christ has made it possible. Uh, this, too, makes it clear that without Christ's blood, there is no access to God, and that there's no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. So just as the old covenant requi required blood sacrifices, the new covenant also requires blood sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. The final and effective blood sacrifice, however, wasn't through the blood of an animal on an altar, but through the blood of God's own Son that was shed on the cross. Well, after telling us in verse 21 that since we have a great high priest over the house of God, the author then gives three exhortations to motiv motivate us to take action. The first one is found in verse 22, where he invites believers to draw near to God with a true heart in full assurance of faith. To whom can we draw near? To the Father. And in what manner can we draw near to him? With a true heart in full assurance. In other words, we can now... You, as a believer, as a Christian, can now stand before God certain that your sins are forgiven by virtue of your faith in Jesus Christ. Now, also in verse 22, there's a fourfold description of how we should, spirit, how we should be spiritually groomed when we come before God. Now, already somewhat mentioned the first one, but first we must come before God with a true heart. The word heart here represents the whole inner life. Now, some have said that although the language differs, the sixth beatitude in Matthew chapter 5 verse 8 carries the same idea, where we're called to be pure in heart. This then would imply that, that a true or, pure, or a pure heart is one that doesn't have any mixed motives or divided loyalties. So as a believer, you're invited to draw near to God. But, this is a big but, it must be with a wholehearted devotion, a genuine heart and a sincere, deep love for him. Second, we must come before God in full assurance of faith. 
now throughout the history of the church, and even to this day, the issue of what this means in full assurance of faith has been controversial. Why? Because even since back in the early days of the church, many Christians struggled with the certainty of their salvation. But if you were to do a deep study, you'll discover that there, Christians are exhorted to know, to know without a shadow of a doubt, doubt that they're saved. See, God grants assurance, not on the basis of man's faith, but on the basis of Christ's faithfulness. The Apostle John writes in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 13, we've given a promise. There's a promise there, promises that the one who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Thus, as a Christian, you're to have full assurance. An assurance that isn't in yourself or in your personal faithfulness, but rather in the object of the faith, Jesus Christ. Third, we must come to God with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. The language sprinkling alludes to the sacrificial, also, also the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. Just as the blood spilled and sprinkled, purified God's people under the old covenant. Christ's blood purifies, purifies us under the new covenant. Jesus' blood, however, cleanses us with superior power and efficiency. His blood, our Savior's blood, unlike that of bulls and goats, purifies our conscience. It cleanses us from sins, from, from sin, and it creates a new heart. It perfects our hearts. And fourth, we must come before God with our bodies washed in pure water. The washing of pure water also points back to the Old Testament where washings of the body were required for, for cleanliness. The thing is that these washings weren't able to cleanse the people. So more than likely, the type of washing that the author here of Hebrews has in mind is a kind of washing that truly purifies it's a washing of pure water that completely clean, clean, cleanses the, the filth of sin from us. It washes every single sin, dirty sin, from us. It's a comprehensive cleansing that purifies us internally, not just externally. The language of washing also suggests a beautiful image pointing to baptism as a picture. Again, not as a picture, not a requirement of salvation. See, in baptism, we're graphically buried. We're buried with Christ and beautifully raised with him in newness of life. And so another way to describe baptism is that it's an outward sign of an, in, of an inward changed, change accomplished by Christ. 
not of you. It's not because of you. It's not because of anything that you did. Because of Christ. But Christ accomplished on the cross. And so we can summarize the four requisites for entering God's presence as sincerity, assurance, salvation, and sanctification. So now that the author has encouraged us to draw near to God in verse 22, the next one he gives, the next exhortation he gives us is in verse 23. And that exhortation flows naturally from the exhortation he had just given in verse 22. Again, there he says, let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering. Since he who promised is faithful. On the grounds of boldness and full assurance, the author of Hebrews implores that we hold on to the confession of our hope. This is a confession that demonstrates faith. It's a verbal verification of repentant hearts. And so what is the confession of Christian hope? Jesus is Lord and Jesus saves. Now the writer of Hebrews isn't referencing a lengthy doctrinal statement. The confession in his mind is the central confession that Jesus saves sinners. See, as Christians, we must never waver or stray from that confession in any capacity. Like the author's audience, we must hold on to the confession in which we initially place our hope. This also tells us that, that the Christian holds on not by his own tenacity, but by God's faithfulness. We will persevere until the end because God has promised not to abandon his people or his children. And we can hold on to this promise because he has proven throughout scripture time and time again that he is faithful to his promises. One of those promises is in John chapter 6, verse 37, where Jesus said, Everyone the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. We're also told in John chapter 10, verse 28, that no one who comes to Christ can ever be snatched out of his hand. So this means that God's power guards his children. Man can do nothing by his own power to keep himself. Furthermore, the security of God's protection and provision allows the church to hold the confession without wavering. I want our study of Hebrews We've seen that there, there's an emphasis on the glorious hope of the believer. For example, in chapter 2, verse 10, we saw that God is bringing many sons unto glory. In chapter 3, verse 1, believers are partakers of the heavenly calling and therefore can rejoice in hope. In fact, hope is one of the main themes of Hebrews chapter 6. Also in chapter 9, verse 28, we're looking for Christ to return. And we'll see later on when we get to chapter 12, verse 14 tells us that we are seeking a city that is yet to come. So when, so when a believer has his hope or her hope fixed on Christ and relies on the faithfulness of God, then he or she will not waver. Instead of looking back, as the Jews so often did, we should look ahead to the coming of the Lord. 
Now in the last two verses that we're going to be reading, the author states his third exhortation. And then let me read those, those two verses, verse 24 and 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. And let us watch out for one another and to provoke, to, and let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. In these two verses that we just read, the author addresses the need for Christian fellowship and encouragement and extends his exhortations into the future so we can see, so we can clearly see the approaching day of the Lord. But shifting to the present in verse 24, the author stresses Christian fellowship and the church's role in helping believers persevere until the end. We cannot have confidence, my friends, and full assurance of faith apart from the church. And we also cannot endure in isolation. Each Christian each believer desperately needs the body of believers for encouragement. So you see, to obtain assurance, we need continual reminding from other saints, from your brothers and sisters in Christ. Christ calls his followers to bring out the best in each other. And as believers, we must actively and verbally stir one another up to love and good works. An unhealthy church fails to do this. And unfortunately, some churches bring out the worst in their attendees rather than the best. There's an old hymn called, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. That hymn there beautifully echoes the fellowship in the Lord Jesus Christ and the value of bearing one another's burdens. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we mustn't neglect gathering together for corporate worship and for times of prayer and encouragement. Verses 24 and 25 are strong words of judgment against those who are in the habit of neglecting other believers. Those who neglect assembling together cut themselves off from the very means whereby Christ feeds, assures, and protects his people. To say, I can do this alone. It's to defy the very command of Christ. Some may claim that they can hear better preaching on the internet or that they're too busy to attend church. But these excuses, and that's what they are, excuses reveal the reality of a disobedient heart. Instead of searching for an excuse, Christians should be doing everything within their power to meet together. Now, yes, we're here to assist you, to help you. If your car is broken down, you don't have money to take a bus, but when it comes down to it, if you really, really have that heart, you're going to want to do everything in your power to, to come. You know, people will walk hundreds of miles on a Sunday morning just to attend church. And yet, there are some people who just won't walk a block. You know, again, you must 
have that heart. It's important to have that heart to, to want to be around other believers. Not to see what you can get out of them, but what you can give them. How you can bless them. How you can minister to them. Christians should be doing everything within their power to meet together. Not only because they need to be fed by the preaching of God's word, but also because part of the faith, because it's part of the faith to stir up fellow believers to love and good works. It's said that a giant, that the giant redwood trees in Northern California have relatively shallow root systems. Their enormous weight is supported in part by the interlocking of a tree's roots with those of the other trees around it. As Christians, we need interlocking roots with other believers in the church to withstand the enormous weight of life. And we all know how heavy that weight, of, that weight can be. We need others spurring us on toward love and good deeds in a world that's so bent on self-centeredness and self-gratification. Speaking of the importance of spiritual friends, a Christian author wrote this, unless we are particularly heroic or saintly persons, each of us needs a relationship with at least one other person who also seeks and trusts the simple way the simple presence. Such a spiritual friend can be enormously supportive to us and we to them. You feel a little less alone, a little less tempted to fall mindlessly into complicating traps. Someone else is there who knows whether or not you're trying to pay attention to the simple way. That brings a kind of accountability that's important. When someone else knows and cares, then we pay much more attention to what we're doing. Now, a spiritual community can take at least two forms. A foundational assembly and, a, and spiritual friendships. The foundational assembly is that of the local body of believers, such as a church like this, even, no matter how small or how big it is. A local body of believers meeting together regularly for fellowship around the word and worship of God. As I mentioned earlier, the person who asserts that God can be known, worshipped, and followed out in nature, apart from the church, knows little of scripture, church history, or to Christian experience. I've heard it before. Oh, I don't need to attend church. The, nat the world nature is my church, or, you know, I, I can, you know, I have my own way of worshiping the Lord. I can, you know, just wake up in the morning and, you know, open up the Bible or the Quran or Buddhist teachings and, and become a better person there. With doing that, I don't need church. I don't need to go on Sundays. I can just tune in on the internet, tune in on TV, and make that my church experience. I can have church in my bedroom while I'm in bed. Again, those who say that, those who say they don't need to attend church, they know little of scripture. They know little of church history, and they certainly know, don't know much about the Christian, true Christian experience. See, we're called to gather together regularly for encouragement and accountability. We must not forsake this aspect of the Christian life. 
the other form that uh, Christian fellowship can take, can take is that of spiritual friendships that transcend the boundaries of individual local churches. Most Chris Christian gatherings of the first century were in house churches, which existed in a network reaching throughout a given city. Therefore, we may find meaningful fellowship with like-minded believers outside our immediate church group. Bible study, fellowships, accountability groups, and times over coffee or tea should be encouraged as long as they're doctrinally sound and don't detract from one's commitment to the local church. Such groups can be wonderfully enriching and supporting for believers. These relationships can enhance our sense of community with a broader body of Christ, especially as we seek to live each day in light of the great day of Christ's return. So that's why we also, that's why we encourage you so much to attend these conferences that I bring up. I can go on my own and with my wife and, or, you know, I can go with Isaac, you know, but I'm not helping you out. I'm not doing you any good if I'm not telling you, and I'm not encouraging you, to, encouraging you to attend these conferences, whether it's a one day or a two day or a three day. You're around other believers, like-minded Christians who are also worshiping the Lord, who also want to grow in the Lord, who have maybe similar struggles as you. Where you can share, with, share things with them that you may not be able to necessarily share with someone here. If you really want to grow, if you really want, you know, uh, to, you got to go out there and surround yourselves with other believers. You know, I, something I, I learned through experience and something I teach my kids that you will become the person you surround yourself with. I said that wrong, but I think you know what I mean. If you are, say you're not a drinker or you don't do drugs and yet you're hanging around with people who are, it's only a matter of time before you succumb, you become tempted and you're like, well, I'll, I'll just try it. I'll go ahead and do it. Same is true with those who, you know, if you've committed yourself as a young person not to have sex outside of marriage, if you're surrounding yourself with friends that are constantly going out and sleeping around, again, it's just a matter of time before you will too. And I know also because of, I, I've seen it, those who are devoted to their wives or husbands and they have no intention of straying or when they surround themselves with people who are cheating on their wives or their husbands, again, it just becomes easier over time to start compromising, to start justifying it in your head to want to do it. And, and, and yeah, it could be very easy to fall. You need to surround yourselves with other believers who will encourage you who will help you to keep your focus on the Lord, that will hold you accountable when you're not acting right, when you're, not doing some, when you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing. You need to be around your brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, in the final verse that we read today, the author turns his focus on the future. The word day specifically refers to the day of Christ's return and God's judgment. 
on that day, Scripture tells us, it will be a time when Christ will call together His entire church, His worldwide church, and will judge those who don't belong to it. Until then, however, faithful anticipation should characterize the church's daily life, your daily life as a Christian. The nearness of our Savior's return ought to make our encouragement of one another and our gathering together all the more urgent and all the more significant. As time moves towards the day of the Lord, the author expects to grow, that the church, the author expects the church to grow in faithful commitment. And just to be clear, no one knows when that day will come. You will never see me, or I'll never stand up here and tell you and give you a specific date of, or even just a roundabout day of when that day will come, when the day of the Lord will come. But here's the thing. The word of God confirms that the day will come and that we're nearer today than we were yesterday. That that day is imminent. It could come a minute from now. It could come a week from now. It could come months from now or years from now. But we must be ready as Christians, as believers, as a church. We must be ready for when that day comes. And as we, as we anticipate his coming, it's important. It's important that we gather together to encourage one another, to help one another, to serve one another. That's important. It's an important question I want to ask you. Is that what you're doing? Can you honestly say that that's what you're doing? Are you doing everything possible while you're here? Or whatever churches that you attend, are you encouraging your fellow believer to remain steadfast? Are you encouraging them to to grow in the Lord, to get into the word, to pray regularly? Are you sharing in their burdens? I'm not saying take on their burdens. I'm not saying make them your own burdens, but are you listening to them? Are you hearing them out? Are you helping them by encouraging them and telling them that they will get through it, that Jesus will be there the entire time while they're going through that trial or that difficulty? Or are you, again, ask, ask yourself, are you helping your local church? Are you helping the church here to grow into what Christ wants it to be? And now I guess I want you to ask yourself honestly, are you a consumer or are you a producer? Are you just coming here and not doing anything? Or are you producing? Are you just wanting to receive, 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 and not give? Friends, it's better to give than to receive. Day is coming. You will have to stand before the Lord, and he will ask you. He will judge you. He will hold you accountable for what he's been giving you, where he's placed you. Will you come up with excuses? Will you say, yes, Lord. I took whatever you gave me and I gave. I gave all that I had. Even though it was just a little bit, I gave all that I had. It's important 
that you remain vigilant and ready for his return. So I hope you can see that in these verses, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25, isn't just some in, insignificant text. Its role in moving from instruction to application is significant. Gives, it, it does, it gives it huge significance. It tells us that if we have proper confidence that comes from our access and advocacy before God, then there are three, three, three things that we must do for the sake of the church and her survival. First, we must draw near in prayer to God with wholehearted sincerity. Our entire human spirit must be engaged in prayer and worship. Second, we must hold on to the anchor of hope we possess. Our hope is in Jesus and is anchored in heaven where he intercedes for us. This isn't just some random or blind optimism. It's, it's a tremendous reality. Lastly, we must devote ourselves to the corporate church and do everything we can to provoke one another to love and good deeds. I went into that already. Now, before I close today, I want you to think prayerfully, prayerfully through each of these three exhortations. Which one do you, do you need to apply the most? Do you need more consistency in drawing near to God in faith? This discipline is really the foundation for the other two. If it's lacking, the others won't be strong either. Perhaps your need is to be bold in holding fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. I think all of us can improve in considering how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. I think also we can all use some more strength, encouragement, to be able to boldly confess to others the hope that we have. We must be able to not be ashamed of what Jesus did for us, to did for you, what he did for you after you leave here today. When you go on throughout for the, for the rest of your day or throughout the week, I want you to think through some specific ways that you can grow in the area that God prompts you to consider. Boldly, unashamedly, come to God and ask Him how you can put your glorious position in Christ into daily practice. Where are you falling short from, brother and sister? Come to him, and he will show you. You may not like what, you, what he shows you. It may sting, it may hurt, but he will. And it's for your own good, though. You're in a glorious position. As a Christian, you're in a, in a position that, I don't know, it's, it's, it's wonderful, it's amazing. Do you know that you are, you are in a position where you can come to the Lord at any time, at any moment, freely? Others think that they need to do certain things in order to have that access before God. And yet, and still there are others 
who are completely lost, who are completely, who are heading towards eternal damnation, eternal separation from God. Think about the position you're in and glorify God for it. Glorify Him every single day, every single moment. Before I end, as I usually do, I want to ask those who have no hope, they, they're completely separated from the love of Christ. I want to invite you to come to the Lord and have a relationship with Him. Come, to come to Him and be born again. So if that's you and you've never trusted in Jesus You've never considered him before, but now you know, you believe in what he did for you. I want to lead you in a prayer to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So wherever you're at, close your eyes. And, and as I mentioned earlier, come to him with a sincere heart with a true heart, with a pure heart. Pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. And I'll turn from my sins and confess you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. And now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, a miracle just happened. And there are angels celebrating in heaven right now because of that. You want to hear your story. You want to hear you know, how you came about watching this video and I want to encourage you and maybe help you in your next step as a Christian. This road, it's going to be bumpy. It's going to be, uh, it's not always going to be perfect. But you can have that full assurance that Jesus your Savior, our Savior, will be with you the entire way from beginning to end. He will never abandon you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You have a glorious Savior. Thank you for taking time out of your Sunday to watch us, and I hope that you will, couldn't, you will join us as we finish off next week, if, next week as we finish off chapter 10. As I mentioned in the beginning, please share this with anyone who you believe really needs to hear this message. Thank you. We appreciate you. We hope that you have an amazing week. You will be, you go out there and, and be the salt and light wherever you're at. Be blessed. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. 
If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.